Okay, well thank you very much. I appreciate you being here and I uh, want to thank Stephen Ricks for the invitation to participate in this conference. This is my first time uh, joining this conference and it's, uh, it's an honor to be here with friends and colleagues and I hope that my thoughts today are some kind of a helpful contribution to it, even if we're fast forwarding a few millennia into the world of late antiquity. Well, it is uh, well known that Jewish temple worship in the biblical and second temple periods was centered on the Jerusalem temple and the priestly rituals performed there. Most Jews believed that the presence of God resided within this sacred space and viewed its hereditary priesthood as the mediating link between the human and divine realms. Because of the centrality of the temple, its destruction in 70 CE caused many adjustments to be made within Jewish religious life. Traditionally, scholars have viewed this event as a watershed that created two distinct eras in the socio-religious history of ancient Judaism. The era of the temple cult and priestly leadership that predominated before 70, and the era of democratized synagogue worship under the leadership of rabbinic sages that flourished after 70. According to the traditional narrative, these periods produced two inherently different forms of religious experience. During the era of the temple, Jewish worship was largely restrictive in its demarcation of sacred space, its complex system of rituals, and its priestly mediation of the divine realm. In contrast, post-Temple Judaism, shaped by rabbis whose authority derived from their scholarship rather than their lineage, created an environment in which prayer and sage-led Torah study allowed all to enjoy the divine communion once exclusively facilitated by priests. The memory of the Temple and an honorary status for priests may have lingered into the rabbinic period, but the nature of Jewish ritual and leadership had fundamentally changed. In the words of one classic study, rabbinic synagogue services transformed worship from the realm of the altar and the priest to the everywhere and the everyman. Another influential work asserts that post-70 synagogue services freed Judaism completely from the sacrificial temple cult, and of all external paraphernalia, such as worship sites endowed with special sanctity, priests, and other incidentals, and thus created a completely spiritual service of God. As a result of this paradigm, pre-70 temple worship and post-70 synagogue liturgy are typically studied as two separate and distinct categories of Jewish religious experience. Some aspects of this bifurcated model accurately articulate the shift from temple to synagogue. For example, Jewish sacrifice did come to an end in 70, and the loss of the temple did create a vacuum which subsequently enhanced the status and liturgical role of synagogues. However, more recent scholarship has undermined two key elements of the traditional approach. First, evidence now suggests that the transition from priestly to rabbinic leadership was not as sudden or ubiquitous as previously thought. It now seems that in the centuries following the destruction of the temple, rabbinic sages did not possess widespread authority within the Jewish community, including within synagogues, and that in some circles, priests continued to maintain a high degree of social and religious influence. In short, the diversity of belief and practice that characterized the Second Temple period continued within Judaism long after the Temple's destruction. Second, current research indicates that the post-70 synagogue was not a heterogeneous, heterogeneous replacement for the Temple, which provided an antithetical form of worship. Instead, a careful study of synagogue liturgy, architecture, and iconography shows that after the destruction of the temple, synagogues became the setting in which some communities could preserve aspects of priestly temple worship. Certainly, there were important differences between the temple cult and synagogue liturgy, most notably the absence of sacrifice and the decentralization of sacred space, but the transition of Jewish worship after 70 might not have been as dramatic a shift as previously imagined. Rather, there appears to have been a significant degree of continuity in religious experience between the temple and post-temple eras, both in the perpetuation of temple activities and in the ongoing liturgical role of priests within a synagogue context. In this paper, I will highlight two ways in which the essence of temple worship and priestly mediation continued in synagogues after 70 CE. Number one, the core synagogue liturgy that developed shortly after 70 was an adaptation of the daily services of the temple in which priests led a communal prayer and bestowed divine blessings upon the congregation. This shows that the allure of temple worship and priestly mediation persisted within Judaism long after the destruction of the temple. Number two, despite this heritage, different Jewish congregations in the post-70 period advocated varying degrees of association between the temple and synagogue. 
Some circles, such as the early rabbinic movement, attempted to distance the synagogue activities from the temple and priesthood and to replace those former institutions with alternative forms of worship, while other, pro other circles promoted the connections between synagogues and these institutions by recreating temple space and priest-centered liturgies within a synagogue setting. By exploring these developments, we can better appreciate the ways in which the legacies of temple and priesthood continued within the Jewish community of late antiquity. To begin, it is important to note that one of the primary ways in which post-70 synagogues perpetuated the essence of temple worship was in the development of a common temple-based prayer liturgy. Unfortunately, the extant sources do not allow us to reconstruct its exact origins and early content, but there exists enough evidence to make some general observations. For example, it is clear that shortly after 70, a framework of communal prayer developed in a synagogue setting that was intended to recall the daily worship services of the Jerusalem temple. Before 70, the highest moment of Israel's divine communion was the twice daily sacrificial service performed at the Jerusalem temple, eventually known as the Talmud. The Torah legislates that priests were to sacrifice a lamb each morning and afternoon. God promised that he would meet with the children of Israel during these ceremonies, speak with them there, and in so doing, they would be sanctified by his glory. The daily offering also reaffirmed the power of Aaronic priests to minister before God. This moment of divine communion, facilitated by the priesthood, was to be a reminder that God dwelt with his people throughout all their generations. By the late Second Temple period, the twice-daily sacrifice was accompanied by a prayer service in which congregations assembled in the outer courtyard of the temple while priests made intercession on their behalf. A priest dressed in white garments entered the sanctuary, burned incense in front of the temple veil, and offered petitionary prayers for the welfare of the nation. That priest then emerged from the sanctuary, raised his hands above his head, and pronounced a blessing upon the congregation. Because this was the moment of epiphany, when God's presence would be manifested, the congregation responded with prostration. Of all of the festivals and holy days, the Tamid was Israel's preeminent ritual of divine communion. When the temple was destroyed, the Jewish community did not abandon this defining ritual and replace it with a fundamentally different expression of worship. Instead, the essence of the Tamid was transferred to synagogues in an adapted form. Shortly after 70, synagogue congregations began to perform a prayer service every morning and afternoon at the same times as the daily temple offerings were made. These localized synagogue services did not include sacrifice, but they did attempt to replicate the prayers, priestly mediation, and divine communion once experienced in the temple. According to the extant sources, synagogue prayer services were led by local priests who dressed in white garments and removed their sandals, thus appearing as the priests who officiated in the daily uh, services of the temple. These priests stood before the synagogue's Torah chest, which was now seen as a representation of the divine presence among the community, and led this congregation through a series of petitionary prayers called the Amidah. These prayers extolled God's virtues and requested his intervention on behalf of Israel using language reminiscent of the intercessory prayers for the community previously offered by priests in the temple. To conclude the synagogue prayer services, the priests raised their hands above their heads and pronounced a blessing upon the congregation. This synagogue service created a liturgical environment which brought together the sacred past, present, and future. Although the Amidah, or through the Amidah, post-70 Jewish communities could feel connected with the biblical past by remembering Israel's preeminent temple ritual, the Tamid, and approximating its performance in a local setting. It also allowed congregations in the present to experience the essence of divine communion once offered in the temple by having a priest stand before them, offer intercessory prayers to God on their behalf, and bestow his blessings upon them. Finally, the performance of the service and its petitionary prayers encouraged the congregation to anticipate a future in which the temple and its full sacrificial services would be restored. In these ways, post-70 synagogue services did not represent a sharp break from temple worship, but provided a setting in which aspects of temple ritual and priestly mediation of the divine realm could remain at the center of the community's religious experience. In addition to the temple-based framework of synagogue prayer services, features of synagogue art and architecture also reflected the legacy of the Jerusalem temple and priesthood in the post-70 period. At this point, it is important to note that the synagogue 
was not a monolithic institution in late antiquity. Instead, synagogue buildings discovered both in Palestine and in the diaspora show a variety of architectural forms and iconographic programs, each apparently reflecting the different ideologies of the Jewish communities that produced them. For example, some synagogues found in the Galilee and the Golan appear to reflect the rabbinic ideal of synagogues as being places of democratized Torah study which replaced the need for the defunct temple cult. In these synagogues, including the structures found at Ein Nashut, Arbel, at DK, and others, there existed a central hall surrounded by benches on three or four of its walls, an absence of interior iconography, and a lack of spatial or liturgical demarcation. Some of these unadorned structures had small platforms for scroll storage near the entrance, which were often visually obscured behind columns, and likely contained portable tables or chests for the reading of scripture in the center of the hall. This arrangement would have created a focus on the open central space as members of the congregation sat facing each other during the services. It also facilitated an auditory rather than visual experience for the community and emphasized the communal nature rather than the hierarchical structure of the synagogue services. While scholars debate the extent to which rabbis built or presided in late ancient synagogues, it does seem that these structures were conducive to the rabbinic worldview that communal Torah study supplanted the need for temple rituals and priestly mediation of the divine realm. However, other synagogues show that some Jewish communities sought to preserve and perpetuate the divine communion of the temple by replicating temple imagery and accentuating priestly hierarchy within a synagogue setting. These features can be seen in synagogue architecture and iconography that recalls the temple's layout, liturgical furniture, and demarcation of ritual space and personnel. The earliest and most prominent example of this development, a process referred to by some scholars as the templization of the synagogue, was the construction of a veiled Torah shrine meant to recall the holies of, holy of holies in the temple and to represent the location of the divine presence within the building. This feature is first attested in the 3rd century synagogue at Dura Europus in Syria. There, the Torah shrine was placed along the main wall of the prayer hall, opposite the entrance, was adorned with images of the Jerusalem temple cult, such as the temple's facade, menorah, and altar, contained an inscription labeling it the Aronah, recalling the biblical Ark of the Covenant, and was covered with the curtain, recalling the temple veil, which hid the contents of the shrine from the site of the congregation until they were, were removed by the individual conducting the services, in this case, a priest named Samuel. Conceptually similar, but more elaborate Torah shrines became prominent features in several basilica-type synagogues during the late Roman and Byzantine periods. These larger shrines are not always preserved among the surviving remains, but they are depicted in synagogues at Hamat Tiberias, Beit Alpha, and others. In these instances, the shrines were placed on an elevated platform or in the apse at the end of the hall, were flanked by seven-branched menorahs, meant to recall the temple menorah, and were separated from the main hall by a chancel screen or a curtain, either hung directly over the shrine or over the entire platform on which the shrine stood. Torah shrines constructed and adorned in this manner seem to replicate temple space within the synagogue by creating a liturgical focus on a physical object meant, uh, meant to symbolize the divine presence, the Torah scroll, placed within a structure meant to resemble the temple's holy of holies. They also created a liturgical distinction between the congregation who could not access the shrine area and the ritual functionaries who were appointed to ascend the platform, pull back the curtain, and remove the scrolls. It was likely at or near this location where the community's priests stood, read from the Torah, led the prayers of the Amidah, and pronounced the priestly blessing upon the congregation, all approximating the priestly Tamid service of the temple. A remarkable observation regarding these synagogues is their close relationship to contemporaneous Christian churches. Church buildings in the Byzantine period, which were un understood by Christians to be local successors of the Jerusalem temple, also employed an apsidal basilica layout with an altar placed inside an apse opposite the entrance and a screen or curtain separating the most holy space from the rest of the hall. In Christian worship, these features were meant to facilitate the divine liturgy which included a veiling of the Eucharistic mysteries, 
communion with the heavenly throne room, and an ecclesiastical hierarchy that mediated the congregation's access to the divine. The differences between the churches and synagogues are obvious. Synagogues contain a Torah shrine rather than an altar in the apse, and display Jewish symbols instead of Christian ones. Nevertheless, the strong similarities suggest that some Jewish synagogues shared liturgical elements with Byzantine churches, inviting us to consider the possibility that the synagogue rituals of some Jewish circles looked more like the Christian mysteries than we, than we would have expected from traditional rabbinic literature. The fact that Byzantine Christians conceptually viewed their church liturgy and architecture as a living continuation of the Jerusalem temple cult supports the argument that those synagogues with analogous features shared a similar template within a Jewish context. In some of these synagogues, the templization of ritual and spatial dynamics were enhanced by iconography on mosaic floors, which provided a sense of liturgical movement towards the shrine. Such mosaic floors, variations of which were found in the synagogues of Mount Tiberias, Beit Alpha, Sepphoris, and others, contained images of the cosmos and temple that progressively led the congregation, either physically or visually, from the entrance of the hall to the veiled Torah ark at the end of the hall. Some had uh, closest to the entrance a depiction of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, there we go, uh, followed by a depiction of the zodiac wheel with Helios in its center, and culminated in a collage of temple items directly in front of the shrine, including menorot, uh, incense shovels, a veil, and the holy ark. This last panel appears to reflect the liturgical furniture located on the platform or in the apse, and strengthens the association of the Torah shrine with the biblical holy of holies. Needless to say, the discovery of these images in more than one synagogue took the scholarly community by surprise. Since, tr since traditional rabbinic literature specifically prohibits the replication of temple items and the depiction of cosmic imagery in synagogues, scholars have long debated the significance of these images and the type of Judaism that would have produced them in a synagogue setting. Although we may never, know, uh, never be certain about either issue, I agree with scholars such as Lee Levine, Jody Magnus, and Rachel Elior, who have variously argued that the most compelling context for understanding both may be the ritual traditions of non-rabbinic priestly circles associated with the Jerusalem temple cult of the late Second Temple period and with the mystical Hecalot literature of late antiquity. For example, following the unsuccessful efforts to find meaning for these images in rabbinic literature, the most comprehensive precedent for this pattern in early Judaism seems to come from the writings of Josephus a priest who served in the Jerusalem temple during the first century and who attached cosmic significance to the spatial arrangement of the temple courtyards. According to Josephus, the sacrifices of the temple's outer court represented the elements of this world. The seven candlesticks and twelve loaves of bread within the holy place represented the planets and zodiac of the heavenly dome. And the holy of holies represented God's throne room. Thus, for a temple priest to travel from one space to another was the ritual equivalent of an ascent from this earth through the cosmos and into the presence of God in the heavenly throne room beyond the dome. Observing that the iconographic program depicted on the later synagogue floors also began with the theme of sacrifice, proceeded to portray the heavenly dome resting on the four corners of the earth, and culminated with a representation of the temple, perhaps the heavenly temple, it is reasonable to suggest that the synagogue congregations who commissioned the artwork had a similar concept of liturgical ascent towards the Torah shrine as Josephus and his priestly contemporaries had during the, regarding the ritual journey toward the Holy of Holies. This again suggests that some Jewish communities responded to the loss of the temple by transferring essential non-sacrificial elements of the temple into a synagogue setting. Unfortunately, no surviving Jewish text from this period provides a systematic description of synagogue activities that would explain precisely how such a liturgy might have been conducted. However, material preserved outside of the traditional rabbinic corpus such as liturgical fragments found in the Cairo Geniza, Jewish ritual texts preserved by Christians, and ceremonies described in the mystical Hecalot literature could provide clues that would allow us to modestly reconstruct 
portions of the liturgy that were performed in these synagogues. Among these sources, we find Jewish rituals, hymns, prayers, and poetry that have a closer relationship to Byzantine Christian liturgy than to rabbinic practices. These include Jewish forms of the trishagion and antiphonal chanting that put the congregation into communion with the heavenly temple and throne room and that allowed access to the divine mysteries through priestly mediation. If indeed these types of rituals were performed in the synagogues surveyed in this paper, they would further demonstrate that different Jewish groups responded differently to the loss of, loss of the Jerusalem temple. While some circles, such as the early rabbinic movement, sought to replace the temple with a more democratized form of sage-led Torah study, other circles viewed synagogues in a setting in which the divine communion of the temple could still be experienced, with synagogues replicating the space of the temple as the meeting place between heaven and earth. It would, thus, uh, it would also seem that the latter form of Judaism retained the biblical emphasis on the need for the hereditary priesthood to provide the necessary mediation between the two realms. This interest in priestly mediation can be seen in several of the synagogues mentioned so far. For example, in, at Dura Europas, the Torah shrine was flanked on its left by a fresco depiction of the biblical priest Aaron offering the daily temple sacrifices, and on its right by a depiction of Ezra the priest reading from a Torah scroll, precisely as would have been done by the priestly leader of the synagogue congregation, thus highlighting to the congregation the past and ongoing need for priests to put the community into contact with the divine realm. Similarly, the mosaic floor at Sepphoris depicts a collage of scenes relating to the consecration of Aaron and his officiating at the daily temple services, their sacrifices, all located between the zodiac or heavenly dome and the Torah shrine or temple panels. So here's the zodiac with the heavenly dome, here's the temple panel, and right in between it are the scenes depicting the Aaronic priests and the uh, consecration of Aaron and the offerings of the sacrifices. Is if some form of liturgical ascent was intended by the mosaic artist, artist, then the mosaic seems to highlight the power of the hereditary priesthood to facilitate the journey through the cosmos and into the heavenly temple. Perhaps not coincidentally, this is precisely the message of the mystical Hecalot literature from late antiquity. Such texts as Merkava Rabbah, Ma'ase Merkava, Hecalot Rabati, Sefer HaRatzim, and Third Enoch each contain a variation on the theme that priestly guides and rituals provide access to the heavenly temple in ways that compensate for the loss of the earthly temple. In many of these texts, the ultimate guide through the heavens is Metatron, the divinized Enoch who became the heavenly high priest. Since Metatron is occasionally associated with the Greco-Roman sun god Helios in Hecalot literature, some scholars, including Jody Magnus, have argued that depictions of Helios in the center of the zodiac wheel on synagogue mosaic floors are meant to represent the ability of the high priest Metatron to provide access to the divine mysteries of the heavenly temple, symbolized by the Torah shrine, or the Torah within the veiled shrine. Of course, this intriguing interpretation is admittedly speculative, but it would accord well with the non-rabbinic nature of these synagogues and their ritual emphasis on the temple and priesthood. The concluding question is, what social circles would have produced this type of synagogue architecture and liturgy? As seen in the preceding descriptions, almost every indication suggests that the circles responsible were Jewish groups who held a worldview similar to priestly circles of the late Second Temple period. The gradation of sacred space, the delineation of the divine presence, and hierarchical mediation all had a long tradition in ancient Judaism, not within the early rabbinic movement, but among the priests responsible for servicing the Jerusalem temple. Similarly, the notion of cosmic ascent and communion with the heavenly temple are well attested among groups, such as the Qumran community and later Hecalot mystics, that cultivated a priestly ideology, but who lacked access to the physical temple in Jerusalem. While some scholars explain the templization of late ancient synagogues as merely a reflection of priestly interests among the larger Jewish community, the evidence suggests that such templization also reflects the continued presence and socio-religious influence of the priests themselves. For example, for example, dominant inscriptions at many of these synagogues indicate that actual priests were responsible for their construction and presumably oversaw the rituals being performed within.
This includes the synagogue of Dura Europis, which was built and presided over by Samuel the priest, the synagogue at Sardis, which was led by Samoe the priest and the teacher of wisdom, the synagogue at Sepphoris, which acknowledges priestly and Levitical donors on its mosaic floor, and other synagogues such as at Susia, Eshtemoa, etc. Therefore, the temporization of these synagogues seemed to go beyond mere priestly interests within the community and seemed to have been inspired and perhaps initiated by circles of priests who themselves wished to maintain their ancestral traditions and their role as the leaders of Israel's worship. In conclusion, this brief survey supports the claim that the socio-religious dynamics of post-70 Judaism were much more diverse than scholars had previously assumed. This diversity included a wider variety of responses to the loss of the Jerusalem temple than, is, than it is attested in the rabbinic literary corpus. While some Jewish circles in late antiquity, such as the rabbinic movement, sought to replace the need for temple ritual and priestly mediation with an emphasis on sage-led Torah study, other circles continued to rely on the ability of the hereditary Aaronic priesthood to mediate the divine realm through an ongoing, if necessarily adapted, interaction with the temple cult. These different worldviews within the post-70 Jewish community are reflected in the diversity of late ancient synagogue art, architecture, and liturgy. While some synagogues appear to have been conducive to the rabbinic ideals of communal Torah study conducted apart from a temple center, center liturgy, other synagogues absorbed many of the non-sacrificial elements of the Jerusalem temple and priesthood through their replication of temple imagery in their artwork, their incorporation of temple features in their architecture, and in the continued role of priests as facilitators of the divine presence. Thank you. May I suggest a couple of questions before we break for lunch? Yes? You said that the sacrifice didn't continue after 70 AD. Can you offer a suggestion as to why it wouldn't have continued? So why did, not, why did the sacrifices not continue after 70? Yeah, I think it actually just comes down to the simple fact that there was no more sacrificial altar on the Temple Mount. Uh, Deuteronomy and the, the Torah legislation seems to legislate that sacrifices were restricted to a certain uh, centralization, a certain centralized space, the Jerusalem Temple, and without that centralized altar space for sacrifices, that was the main part of temple, the temple cult that could not continue, I think, after 70. But we need to remember that the rest of the temple dynamics that were not reliant on the sacrificial altar could, in theory, continue. And, and what I'm arguing here is that they did, in fact, continue in adapted ways through various synagogue liturgies, including uh, priestly mediation through, uh, through leading communal prayer, through offering the priestly blessing, and maybe even some other aspects of, of, of ascent into the, the heavenly throne room as mediated by the priests, all things that were present to some degree in the Jerusalem temple, but then were later adapted uh, to another degree in synagogues afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I have a question on Beth Alpha, uh, mm -hmm. the Beth Alpha synagogue that you had a picture of. Sure. Had three sections. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll go back to it here. Uh, Beth Alpha was right here. It's the one on the right. Sephiroth is the yeah. one on the left. Okay. Is there any correlation? Is that just I'm reading things into it? To the fact simply one, two, and three. Because it's a remarkable, uh, remarkable coincidence, isn't it? Yeah. If, uh, if it's a coincidence, yeah. Really. I mean, there are the stars and the heavens <laughs> and the altar and the guy with the knife. Somewhere. Yes, yes. This is really, really interesting, actually. Now, I've been interested in this for a long time. I can't say that I've put in uh, the scholarly research to try to specifically draw those connections, but I have the same uh, sense that you did as I was listening to the earlier two, uh, two lectures that it's a remarkable parallel, a remarkable pattern, where you have the sacrificial court uh, to begin, you've got the ascent through the heavenly dome, right, uh, and then finally you have the, uh, a temple scene uh, at, the, at the height of this. And so, no, it is remarkable. It certainly reflects, I think, that uh, the threefold nature of temple progression. And that's part of what I'm arguing here, yeah. is that, uh, that these synagogue mosaic floors are to some degree trying to replicate the spatial layout of the Jerusalem temple from outer court to holy place to holy of holies. And so I guess this would relate to the facsimiles to whatever extent the facsimiles are also replicating that progress. Uh, that procession. So that's an interesting thing that requires a lot more research, but uh, it's a fun co a question to consider for now, isn't it? So, yes? I have a question. Uh, the, our Jewish friends and so on, they call their synagogues, some of them call their synagogues temples. Temples. Today they do, yes. Uh, but others 
they call them synagogues, like in Israel and so on. There's synagogues, right. or are they temple? Right. All temples now. Sure, sure. So in modern Judaism, there is a tendency to start uh, uh, mixing up the names for their place of worship, temple, synagogue, etc. Uh, but that really does not reflect, I don't think, the conversation that we're having here. I think that simply ref reflects a more modern blending of the concepts and of the terms and so forth. Uh, but in this particular period, we had different groups of Jews uh, who had varying degrees of, uh, of, of allowing temple and synagogue to be blended like that. So for example, in rabbinic literature, there is a really strong prohibition against replicating temple features inside of a synagogue setting. However, what we're seeing here is a different form of Judaism that is very comfortable blending temple and synagogue together, where in a sense, we're actually replicating temple space within a synagogue setting. So, uh, but unfortunately, I don't think this conversation has anything really to do with the modern use of, of temple and synagogue terminology. In that terminology. day, would it have been temple? I'm sorry? They, in that day, would they call it synagogue these temples? or temple? Uh, well, there's some texts that suggest that the priestly circle, or the circles that built these synagogues, might have referred to them using Ezekiel's term as the little temple, or the mini temple. In fact, some of these synagogues also have inscriptions on them referring to them as the holy place. Uh, terminology that was previously assigned to the Jerusalem Temple as being kadosh or holy or set apart. Uh, well, apparently some of that terminology and that concept is being applied to these synagogues, which are in a sense many temples, many holy places, uh, meant to replicate the temple, but also to keep the temple tradition alive, I think is, is how we might look at that. So yes, in the back. Just uh, one more. Okay. Sure. When I've attended synagogue, especially after I've gone through the temple, I was impressed that um, they put on clothing. They right. sort of like we do, and also they interacted with the divine after the veil was open, the Torah sure, came around, sure. and they interacted. Sure. Did you mention that in the, or did you see that as a parallel to the temple? Sure. Well, I think what we're seeing in, mo in those modern synagogue activities of, of the dressing, the dressing with the white uh, cloths and the, the parting of the, of the curtains to reveal the Torah and all that, uh, what those are showing us is that aspects of these temple dynamics from late antiquity eventually continued into what later became normative rabbinic Judaism. So it started off as two different models with rabbinic thinkers in a sense opposing the temporalization of the synagogue, eventually became adopted into rabbinic Judaism that later became mainstream and normative, which is now the foundation of modern Judaism as we would see it today. So I think that there is a certain genealogical connection between some of the modern synagogue practices of the Veil Torah Shrine, etc., back to some of these late antique uh, precedents. So, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir.